Hello, I'm Kelly at Peace University, and tonight I'm here with um, Bible study. And the, our, my topic tonight is, who do men say that I am? I'm going to be taking the text from Matthew chapter 16, and it's going to come 13 through 16. I know some people have Bibles and they uh, bring bring their Bible so that they can look these things up. So the scripture text tonight is Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. The Bible is broken into two parts. There's the Old Testament or the Old Covenant between man and God, and the New Testament, which is the New Covenant between God and man. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all eyewitnesses to Jesus when he walked on the earth as a man. So I'm going to start reading Matthew 16, 13 through 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. Some, Elias or Isaiah, and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven." Now, let me explain. When Jesus asked his disciple, who do people say that I am? He was talking to his closest followers, the ones who had followed him his three years that he was in this ministry upon the face of this planet. These people were there when he preached. They were there with the multitude. And after, if, if you really study the Bible, you'll find that every time he did a group uh, speech, or lecture, he also would take his 12 away privately and they would go somewhere into a retreat and he, and he would explain to them in detail. He would, he would tell the, the public generally. And a lot of times he spoke in parables and when the disciples would go away with him privately, they would say, what were you talking about? And he said, I'll tell you plainly. So the very Jesus that was with his 12 closest people took a moment to ask them, who, what are people saying about me? Who, who does the public think I am? And, and they said, they think you're a prophet. They think you're a reincarnated prophet of some type. But then he said to them, but who do you say I am? And out of the 12, there was one brave disciple named Peter that said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus again told him, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. And he said, I'm going to give you something because you know that I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Keys to the kingdom of heaven. So tonight I'm going to ask, answer for you three questions based on this text. The first question I have for you tonight, and I want you to ponder, and I hope that I can answer it for you, is what did Peter mean when he said, you are the Christ? The second question I ask you tonight is what did Jesus mean when he said to Peter, flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you? And the third question, that I have for you tonight from this text are what are the keys to the kingdom of heaven that Jesus gave to Peter because he had the right answer. 
So in Matthew 16, 13 through 16, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And because Peter knew who he was and answered and said, you are the Christ. Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the key. Peter was the bold one. Peter was the one that when he saw Jesus walking uh, on the water and he was in a boat, Peter was the brave soul that jumped out of the boat and thought, well, if Jesus can walk on the water, so can I. And he, and he walked on water. I mean, Peter was the bold disciple that didn't think. He just jumped right into everything. And it was Peter that Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom to. The first question I asked you tonight is, what did Peter mean when he said, you are the Christ? Some people think that Jesus Christ, that Christ is his last name. You know, I'll have to admit, I did not know for many years what it meant to, when he, they said Jesus Christ. But Peter knew that that word Christ was not Jesus's last name. But it was a common noun like mother, father, etc. In other words, Christ has a meaning just like ma, mother, father, whatever. It means anointed one. Specifically in this text, the word Christ means text, and this text means prophet, priest, or king. In other words, Savior or Messiah. So Jesus doesn't have in any of his uh, scriptural teaching, he doesn't really have a last name of Joseph's, even though Joseph was married to Mary. Christ means Jesus, the Savior, Jesus, or God saves, or Jesus, the priest, or the king. Those were the titles or the offices that Jesus fulfilled while he was here on the planet. So Christ is really a noun describing who Jesus is. I, I want to go a little clear on why Peter knew that. In Luke chapter 2, it says there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and he was just and devout, and he was waiting for consolation. And, and the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The Lord and God are both nouns or offices of God. God is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You know, God was the creator of the heavens and the earth in Genesis. And in John chapter one, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him. Everything was made by him. So we have in the Old Testament, God. and the New Testament, Jesus is referred to God. In John chapter 10, verse 33, the Jews said, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, they're talking to Jesus. They're saying, you being a man, make yourself God. The Jews wanted to kill Jesus because they said, hey, he, he's saying he is God. Uh, when he healed the leper, he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. How can anyone forgive sins except for God? In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, for unto us a child is born. A child is born. A son is given. Isaiah was a prophet 700 years before Jesus ever walked on the planet. And he prophesied unto us, a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. The government. Look, I'm going to break that down because we're going to get to, the, to one of the questions I ask you is that about the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom, the kingdom is a government, Okay. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. 
and his name shall be called Wonderful, the Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. In this one text, Jesus is referred to as the uh, Mighty God and the Everlasting Father and a child. Okay, Isaiah was a prophet, a prophet, a prophet prophesied and said, this is what's going to happen in the future. 700 years later, in Matthew 1 and chapter 18, it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ, they don't say Jesus and then put Joseph's last name on there. It's Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, God and the flesh, Jesus, the, the Christ is the anointed one that is to rescue not just the Jews, or the Gentiles, but the entire world was on this wise. When, his, when as his mother Mary was in spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. In other words, the reason you never see Jesus with the last name and you hear him referred to as Jesus, the anointed one, or Jesus, the savior, is because Jesus was not born uh, and overshadowed or consummated by two men, a man and a woman, or two mankind, a man and a woman. It's because Mary was overshadowed. That which was conceived in Mary was supernatural. In Matthew 1 and 23, it says, a, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with man or God with mankind. So Jesus was not just a prophet or a priest, but he was the almighty God who clothed himself in flesh and walked among men, made himself subject to everything that you and I are subject to. God himself subjected himself, humbled himself. He washed the disciples' feet. He presented his true nature in a fleshly manner so that we could not only see it, but that we could understand that he understands man. Think about this. Creator of the universe is a one invisible only God. He did not understand what it meant for us to be lonely or rejected or feel pain or be sick or for someone to hurt us. I mean, words hurt us. But when he came in the flesh, embodying himself in a fleshly body, he did that so that he could understand his creation. He wanted to understand what it felt like when we uh, were hurt. I mean, didn't they beat him? They wanted to kill him. The Jews wanted to kill him. So they had him crucified. They used the Roman government, but the Roman government was not the reason why Jesus was crucified. It was the Jewish people that, that had him crucified and used the current government system of that day. Think about it. They beat him. They stripped his clothes off. I mean, how humiliated it, it. Can you imagine people line the street and watch you or me go down the street where they, make, they strip our clothes off naked and they beat us publicly until we can't even walk. He understands pain. Matter of fact, uh, from reading the Bible, someone else had to come and help him uh, bear his cross because he was so weak from the beatings and, and they mocked him. I mean, how many people hate a bully or someone that mocks you? I mean, it's really one of the worst things is when people mock us or make fun of us. And they mocked him. They, they put a a robe of thorns on his head and said, Oh, King, what are you going to do? You can, you know, you say you're a King and you have a kingdom, let him come and rescue you. Now they mocked him. He felt pain. He felt rejection. One of the 12 of his closest spear is the one that went to the Jewish 
um, leaders and said, I know where Jesus is. And then when they, when he brought them to Jesus, he didn't just say, Hey, that's Jesus over there, right over there among these people. The Bible says he betrayed him with a kiss. I mean, the, the one that you had been with and spent time with and personally chosen to accompany you betray. And he said to Judas, he said, you betray us, the son of man with a kiss. So he understands betrayal. He understands rejection. You know, it's almost unbelievable to think that the creator of the universe. And, you know, at one time, one of them said something to him, mocking him. And he said, if I wanted to, I could call a legion of angels right now. But he chose not to. I know you're probably understanding why. And I would say that I was reading the Bible for a, at least a year before I had the answer to that question. Why did he do it? Why did the creator of the universe decide? I'm going to save that for another Bible study. But I will say that it's a humbling thought to know that the creator of the universe loved mankind enough to come and understand what we go through as humans in this world that we live in. I mean, I'm going to leave this on this, who is the Christ that Peter uh, so boldly proclaimed and said, thou art the Christ. Think about this. Is there any other prophet of any religion anywhere in the world that time stopped? Don't you know that we're in 2022 AD or after the death of Jesus? So it doesn't matter what country you're in, what religion, everybody recognizes this as before Christ or AD, BC or AD, before Christ or after death. I mean, before Christ, there were thousands of years. So really, the you know, mankind's been on the planet longer than 2022. So I ask you this question. Think about that when we realize that Jesus does not have a last name. He says he's the mighty God in Isaiah 9, 6. And his last name is the Christ. I want to leave that with you on point number one. So I hope I answered your question that says, what did Peter mean when he said, you are the Christ? He meant, Jesus, I know who you are. I know that you are God and the flesh, embodied in the flesh of man. The second question that I, that I asked you and I want to share with you is, what did Jesus mean when he said, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you? He told Peter, Flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you. Reveal, the word reveal means to make known something hidden. Understanding who Jesus is does not just naturally come to us as mankind. Matter of fact, if you read the New Testament, he didn't make it easy for anyone to understand what he was talking about. And his disciples, when they went away privately, they asked him, they said, why are you talking in parables? And he said, so hearing they won't hear and seeing they won't see. In other words, he's saying they need to seek who I am. They have to seek. I mean, what do you think when we pray or when you pray is? You're asking God, you're seeking God. You're knocking on heavens, a spiritual door saying, God, reveal means to make something known that was hidden. And understanding who Jesus is, I tell you, will only come from revelation. And this revelation, it's not human. It's a supernatural revelation. You have to ask and you have to seek and you have to knock to know who Jesus is. It says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Jesus said, ask and and I'm going to give you the answer. Seek and I'm going to make sure you find. Knock and I'm going to make sure it's opened unto you. I mean, and we know that God cannot lie. God is a God of truth. 
He's a righteous God and a holy God. And so if he says, ask, it shall be given. I'll, I just want to tell you, there's been times in my life where, you know, people do things and I'll say, I'll get down and I'll be saying my prayers and I'll, I'll be like, God, is it okay if I do this or do that? You know, I mean, I could give you a lot of illustrations, but for time's sake tonight, I will tell you, eventually God uses some way to answer me and to tell me, an answer or give me a sign, a dream. I'll read something in the Bible. Somebody will say something to me. You know, God doesn't ask us to do anything he doesn't do. I read in John 4 and 23 where it says, the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. What is he seeking? He's seeking people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm going to leave that with you to think about. And God himself knocks. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. God knocks on the door of, of our hearts. It, it could be a little subtle knock, but, you know, he put us all with a conscience to know right from wrong. I mean, we say people have to tell us don't do this or do do this. But honestly, he created us with a conscience to know right from wrong. Whether we listen to it or not is another story. But he says, I'm knocking at the door saying, you know, son, daughter, this is what you should do or this is what you shouldn't do. And then uh, seeking, knocking, and asking. And I just wanted to share this uh, scripture about Jesus asking his disciple. It says, so when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, you know, Simon Peter was the bold one. John was the shy, sweet one that Jesus loved because he just did everything good and he tried to please everybody and God. But Peter was the wild fisherman that would just, you know, jump out there and do it. So he said, he said, when they had died, this is in John 21, 15 through 17. So when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, love thou me more than these? Yeah, Jesus asked Simon, do you love me more than this or this or this or this? And he saith unto him, yeah, Lord, you know that I love thee. And Jesus said, this is what he said to him. He said, feed my lambs. Look, he wasn't talking about lambs, animal. He's talking about mankind is hungry to hear and to know more about him. We have our minds full of social media, technology, television, people, negative people, all kinds of people all around us all the time. And Jesus understands that. It could be our family life is negative. It could be our job. I mean, people are people. Hey, we're all people and negative and, 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 and have issues, right? But Jesus said in John 21, 15 through 17, he said, lovest thou me? He said, feed my lambs. And verse 16, he saith to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, you know that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he asked him three times, Lovest thou me? He's like, God, you know I love you. And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. You're the creator. Look, you can read it for yourself in John 21, 15 through 17. He said, Lord, thou knowest all things. You see, Peter knew that Christ was God in the flesh. He said, you know I love you. And Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. I'll tell you, that scripture means a lot to me because that's what made me start the Zoom 
session is to give the word of the Almighty God to His beloved, and His beloved are people. God loves people. He loves people so much that He came in the flesh just so He could feel what it feels like to be hurt or to suffer pain or rejection. But I'm going to go back since we're close on time here. I'm going to go back to the third question that I wanted to answer tonight. And that is, what are the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Keys to the kingdom of heaven. A key is something that unlocks the door. And the kingdom of heaven is where God rules or governs. Kingdom, got to have a king. King's in charge. Kingdom of heaven is the ruler of the kingdom of heaven. That's why the Jews placed over Jesus' head king of kings or king over the Jews or king of kings. You see, in Matthew chapter 3, the very beginning of the New Testament, after 400 years of silence from a prophet, we read, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent. That means, hello, you got to change your wicked ways. you got to turn from your sins. Repent doesn't mean saying sorry. Repent means about face, like a military about face, like you're going in a different direction. In other words, you stop going in the direction you're going and you're like, you know, I'm going to repent. I'm going to try to get a relationship closer to this creator, the almighty God, the one invisible God, the God that had a, a covenant with Abraham that said, I'm going to make your uh, offspring innumerable. He was talking about the day that Jesus would come and the gospel would be preached to the entire world for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John the Baptist said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He, he was telling the world, oh, watch out. Heaven is coming to earth. And who he was talking about, it says, for this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. In other words, the kingdom of heaven was when God himself came to this earth. And he became, let me just take it right back to the very first scripture that I read to you that said um, in Isaiah 9, 6, it says that he's the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the mighty God, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. God is in charge of our world. <laughs> you know, I know that there's kings and leaders of many nations that think they're in charge. But when Jesus Christ came to this planet and he was God in the flesh, he came with authority that his kingdom is at hand. So I want to leave this with you tonight. The 12 disciples were the 12 men that Jesus left to take his mission and his message to the world. And here we have it, that he gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven to one bold fisherman named Peter. Starting next week, I'm going to start this series on whom do men say that I am. And we're going to learn more about this message and this mission that Peter brought to us by the keys to the kingdom being handed to him by the almighty God himself. I look forward to sharing this. I'm going to have a lot of guest speakers with me over the next couple months. They're going to be, um, I'm hoping different people from different countries will come so that we can see that this keys that Peter had and that was delivered to him was something that touched the entire world. Thank you for joining me tonight, and I hope you'll join me next week too. God bless you.